Hey friends, good to see you. It is Thursday the 29th of April 2021. I almost said the 28th. Reason being is after the first few thousand days, they all start to come into a bit of a blur. And uh, today, episode 89 of the Infinite series that is Mark talks about all his records. If you've watched any of these before, you'll notice that I wear t-shirts that are appropriate, generally and where possible, towards whatever it is that I'm talking about. The more attentive of you will have noticed I'm wearing a Cure t-shirt with the cover of the top album on it. I bought this at the Hammersmith Apollo, although really it's always going to be the Hammersmith Odeon, uh, in December 2014, when The Cure played three shows there, uh, and they played all ten songs from the album, The Top, uh, not necessarily in order uh, to mark the, the album's 30th birthday. And today, the more astutely minded of you will notice that I am going to be talking about The Cure, uh, although it's probably in the title of the episode here. Now, although this only covers one proper Cure studio album, it covers six actual albums um, and a multitude of singles. In this strange and unusual period of world history, Robert Smith was a member of three bands simultaneously. One, The Glove, featuring Robert Smith and Steve Severin from the ba Susie and the Banshees. Uh, he was also a member of The Cure. Here's the compilation album Japanese Whispers that features all their late 1982 and 1983 recordings. He's also a member of Susie and the Banshees, and here is Nocturne, their, uh, their first live album, recorded in 1983 with Robert Smith on guitar. The Cure's the top album, recorded and released in 1984. Susie and the Banshees' Hyena, also recorded and released in 1984. And Concert, The Cure Live, recorded and released in 1984. It's fair to say that uh, Robert Smith was an extremely busy man during this period, and The Cure were an extremely busy band. Um, although... As you will see, there was only one studio album. Uh, Robert was dividing his time between being a member of Susie and the Banshees, who he joined on guitar in, I think, October 1982, and The Cure, and also on his days off uh, being a member of the, the trio The Glove, featuring himself, Steve Severin, uh, and a female vocalist called Jeanette Landre. So, with all that uh, bearing in mind, what it means is I'm going to show you an awful lot of records and I'm going to talk very, very quickly about a huge number of things that happened in a very short period of time. I think it's it's probably fair to say that no one single human being could work as hard as this unless they ingested industrial amounts of illegal substances. Uh, and if there's one thing which, which screams out at me loud and clear from the top is drugs, lots of drugs and lots of psychedelia. Um, but we have to go back a little bit in time before we get to the top. So November 1982, The Cure may, may not have split uh, after a serious, um, if that's a word, uh, on stage bust up on the last day to the tour and a fight in Strasbourg. Um, and nobody really knows what's happening. Susie and the Banshees need a new guitarist. Robert Smith may not have a band. Um, and Lol Tolhurst is, is learning the keyboards. Uh, so Robert takes a phone call. Would you like to join Susie and the Banshees? And he does. And he starts touring with Susie and the Banshees in October 1982 before becoming a permanent member in November 1982. Um, at the same time, November 1982 saw the release of the first Cure single as a, a duo, uh, Let's Go To Bed. Robert Smith on the front, Lol Tolhurst on the back. About a month or so after the end of the tour, Robert rang Lol, said, do you want to go into the studio? Lol went, is it just going to be the two of us? And the answer was yes. So the Cure decided to turn over a new leaf and start again. For this period of the band, um, Lol has now ceased being a drummer. I have been critical of his drumming abilities in a previous episode. It's fair to say, in his book, Cured, the story of his time in The Cure, he is uh, fairly frank and open that he's neither the best keyboard player or drummer in the world. But whatever he did, he tried to the full extent of his abilities. And should point out, by the way, that The Cure using a drum machine is not a first. When they played 100 years on the pornography tour, uh, Lol played keyboards 
and a drum machine did all the drum work. So all those people that moan about how the Cure use a drum machine these days for a hundred years, that's the original arrangement as well as with a drum machine. Okay, and I'm not going to get into tolerating any debates about which Cure drummer is the best because um, that's not a very interesting conversation right now. Right now, the Cure don't have a drummer. They have a keyboard player, they have a drum machine, they have Robert Smith. Uh, and Let's Go To Bed is a complete kind of turnaround from the previous album, Pornography. As I've said in a previous episode, Pornography is quite a difficult listen because much as I love Doom and Gloom and Light and Shade, Pornography is all shade. Uh, it's a tough album to listen to because it has very little sunlight in it, so it's all full of dark, brooding epics. Uh, and any album that's got cold, a short-term effect, a hundred years and pornography on it is always going to be a difficult meal to eat and I thought I think that let's go to bed shouldn't be regarded as, as a big kind of betrayal of the cure at all in fact it actually is more like a, a return to the band's initial songwriting which was quite poppy uh, quite direct and with a fair chunk of silly in it as well let's go to bed is built upon uh, an initial melodic idea that appears on the two CD version of pornography which is just behind me here uh, there's a track on there which is called Temptation, last track on CD2, which is called a, uh, an, a studio demo, which then evolved into Let's Go To Bed. So it's got the same keyboard lines and general feel as Let's Go To Bed, but it's a kind of like a darker middle point around that. So Let's Go To Bed is one of the best 12-inch singles of 1982, in fact, if not of all time, which is um, a number of... of uh, of really interesting tracks on it so let's go to bed is a, just a lovely silly mindless charming pop song uh, backed with just one kiss and by the way uh, the band didn't play just one kiss live until 2012 uh, it came in two two editions here's the the seven inch with the standard pop mixes on the a and b uh, the old-fashioned silver versions where uh, they save themselves a whacking couple of pence by not using a paper label on there um, and these are seven inch edits the 12 inch versions of the songs are longer and extended and i think just one kiss is something like seven and a half minutes long on the on the 12 inch i'm not sure if it's been reissued actually the 12 inch versions of let's go to bed or just one kiss so you may only be able to get them on this this 12 inch they might be on the 2018 expanded edition of the remix album mixed up and there's a lovely, charming, interesting, and, and not entirely unexpected uh, left turn for The Cure. It's only unexpected if you weren't paying attention to what The Cure were, which was, you know, a multitude of things. And the next single that they released uh, is called um, The Walk. And The Walk, I think, is, this is a four-track EP. Uh, it was also released as a six-track mini-album in some countries, backed with Let's Go To Bed and Just One Kiss on it as well. This is a, a great, great little EP, uh, effectively a mini-album. It doesn't feature any extended or 12-inch mixes at all. It's all new stuff. So there's a 7-inch of The Walk, which is here. And the 7-inch of The Walk had uh, just The Walk, and I think it's got the upstairs room on the B-side. I've not actually checked for a long time. Uh, no, it's got the dream, so I am wrong. Uh, so it's got the walk and the dream on it. And that's uh, just a lovely seven inch single. It was th this was the time, by the way, when the band started to get into formatting. There's a poster sleeve, seven inch of the walk, which I haven't got because I was buying these records with pocket money and I wanted that pocket money to go as far as it possibly could. And whilst this is the 12 inch of the walk. If I remember correctly, the B side, uh, the A side, the first track is the upstairs room and then it's the dream. And then it's back with the walk and a re-recording reflected this track called Lament. Um, so actually the walk is the B side of the 12 inch, uh, which kind of makes you think that maybe the walk wasn't such an obvious seven inch single, but the walk is one of the best Cure singles that there is. And if I recall correctly, and I could be wrong, that the drums were played on this by Steve Golding from uh, Elvis Costello's band. And there was a, a conversation in the studio around, well, and I think this, this conversation probably happened during the recording of Let's Go To Bed, where someone said, well, um, if we have to play it on a TV show, you know, Long was like, well, can I be credited with the drums? And they were like, no. And I said, 
And it was like, oh, okay. Well, yeah, but if we have to play it on a TV show and you can't play the drum patterns, then it's going to be fairly obvious that you didn't play drums on the track. Uh, and so the the move from long, from drums to keyboards kind of happens more as a, um, a mother of invention, really, is because I think some of the drum patterns that are on things like Just One Kiss, The Walk, they're beyond Long's abilities. Um, and so Steve Golding played drums on those and Long became the keyboard player. Um, and The Walk is actually, in many ways, very reminiscent of Blue Monday uh, by that band New Order, who I've talked about elsewhere. Uh, it's got a same kind of bum 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 uh, kind of synth line. It's got the same kind of very kind of um, metronomic uh, boxy rhythm track, a boom 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 boom, which is very similar to uh, Blue Monday's did a little and 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 Anyway, I can't. I just, why am I even narrating the sound of drums and the sound to you? It's like when Robert Smith does his video, uh, does he did his demos in the eighties, and he would, he would do he would sing the drum parts and then he'd sing the the horn parts. So memory tells me that I read somewhere that the demo of Close to Me is Robert Smith going boom ch boom ch boom ch do 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 be do do be do, and he's kind of singing all the parts in the very first first demo of it. That could be a complete load of nonsense. I I, I don't know. I hope it isn't, um, because I will have uh, grossly grossly misled you at that point. And uh, at that point, Susie and the Banshees were also touring. They played 25 uh, tour stops in 1983, mostly festivals. And when they weren't doing that, Robert Smith was moonlighting as a member of The Cure, who then reformed to uh, play 10 shows in 1983, starting off with, I think, a, a secret show at either Bath or Cheltenham or somewhere like that. Um, and the band had reconfigured themselves. So Andy Anderson... Um, also known as Clifford Anderson, who was uh, a drummer that the, the band had met, um, came in on drums. Phil Fornalley, who I think had produced pornography, uh, was playing bass. Robert was on keyboards, uh, guitar, vocals, mostly guitar and vocals, and Lon was on keyboards. And the band had only rehearsed for four days before they played the first one of the shows. And the sets were almost exclusively old material. So if you like The Cure because of Let's Go to Bed and The Walk, you weren't you probably weren't going to hear those songs. Uh, I think they played The Walk at less than half of their shows in 1983. I think they played Lament once. I don't think they played Let's Go to Bed, and I don't. Uh, and they didn't play Love Cats, uh, I think, on, on the 1983 shows either. So if you like The Cure, the new poppy Cure that uh, hit, then you go to see them and they don't play the hits. They play you know, an hour and a half of, of really intense, hard, tough songs. Uh, from the from the first four albums and none of the recent hit singles, um, it's a pretty ballsy move I think. But then the Cure are nothing if not forging their own path valiantly and occasionally stubbornly through the rest of the world. Uh, so whilst whilst Robert was was touring as uh, a, a member of the Cure and then also simultaneously as a member of Susie of the Banshees, on the day that they played in I think it was. Uh, it was, I think, San Francisco, I think. They they released the first, or more correctly, Robert released the first release by the third band he was in at that time, The Glove. This is the seven-inch single of, um, I think it's Like an Animal, Like an Animal. Uh, and actually, if you're a real train spotter, you will notice that it's got uh, a hole die cut in it that fits in with the centre of the record, which is the only seven-inch single I've got that's got a die cut hole stamped through the middle of it. I think this is intentional. I've never seen another copy of this single. Uh, and Like an Animal is big, brash, psychedelic, weird. I mean, if there's one thing that this album, if you listen to this album, and I think you can probably tell by by looking at the cover to, to uh, Like an Animal, if there's one thing that it tells you, it goes, you ain't in Kansas anymore. You know, that doom and gloom band that made pornography last year, that's not this band at all. And this isn't Susie and the Banshees either. This is something new and weird and unusual. And I love The Glove. I think they're they're an incredible band, uh, even though they, they only made one album and two singles, uh, never played live. And when uh, Robert Smith announced that he was playing a, a show as, as um, I think, what is it, uh, Robert Smith and, and uh, his imaginary friends, I was kind of hoping that we'd get some songs from The Glove album. 
played live or some of the other songs that Robert's recorded solo in that set. Uh, but we got a, a Cure show at the Royal Festival Hall uh, that was a tiny and weird set. So I was over the moon anyway, even if some of the other people that weren't at, that were at the gig. In fact, the guy that was in front of me at that gig was texting his girlfriend saying he was bored as hell uh, and spent the, the time when they were performing It's Over for the first time since 2009 looking up lasagna recipes on his mobile phone. Uh, and I thought, dude, there are people that will really, really should be here instead of you. Of course, I didn't say that. Um, I just wanted to, to watch The Cure, frankly. So I just pretended I couldn't see him and had a much better gig playing air guitar instead, whilst nobody really cared. Uh, but the, the Cure were uh, playing, I think, San Francisco's Kabuki Theatre uh, on the day, the 9th of August, 1983, when... The Glove released Like an Animal. So that is Robert Smith in his third band simultaneously at the same time. And I cannot over him, overstate how good the Glove album is. If you think, God, I wish The Cure made more records, listen to The Glove. They are a fantastic band. Um, and you can clearly see, by the way, very clearly, you, know, you can draw a line between The Glove and uh, The Top, which is the next Cure studio album. There's uh, a multitude of releases which came out around about this time it was an expensive time to be a cure fan uh, but that's not necessarily a surprise the uh, the next thing that came out was blue sunshine the soul studio album by the glove this is i think a, an original 1983 edition on wonderland records so part of the um susie and the banshees stable there uh, and it's i mean this has been reissued uh, repressed on blue vinyl number number of times this is a surprisingly well put together uh, album. It's got three vocal tracks by Jeanette Landre. Then it's got a, a Robert Smith song and then it's got an instrumental and it's that format for each side. So it opens with Like an Animal. Uh, and then it's got Looking Glass Girl, Sex Eye Makeup, Mr. Alphabet Says, which is just one of the strangest songs that Robert Smith has ever sung. Uh, and then it's got a blues in drag. And I think a blues in drag might turn up as uh, the credits music in a film called The Cure in Orange. Um, and then the B-side is Punish Me With Kisses, This Green City, Orgy, Perfect Murder and Relax. Contractually, Robert Smith wasn't allowed to sing more than a certain percentage of any one song or any one, uh, any one album um, if, he was a, if he was not a member of The Cure. So they had to get somebody else in to sing. Otherwise, Robert Smith... Uh, would have sung every song on this album. And on the 2006 reissue of the album, a double CD, uh, Robert Smith's vocals can be heard on the second CD. So effectively a brand new Robert Smith album. Um, and this is a a really great record. I love it to bits. Um, it, it picks up from the, the kind of left field, weird uh, post-punk sound that sometimes you've got on things like Three Imaginary Boys. Um, but also hugely indebted to both, as previously mentioned, the enormous amount of drugs that were ingested while this album came out. And also, I think you can really hear a lot of the Sid Barrett influence on this. You may not necessarily hear a Sid Barrett influence on The Cure. You can definitely hear a Sid Barrett influence on, on this album. And I cannot recommend it enough. It's bloody brilliant. And I wish the glove were still going, but they're not. Um, and then there was a second single... Here we have it. This is Punish Me With Kisses. Uh, this was only released as a 7 inch. It wasn't released as a 12 inch. And it's backed with a, a track called The Tightrope. And it's very good and a little strange. And as you can see on the back, it's not exactly hiding who's in the band. If you're paying attention, you, know, you go, where did Robert Smith find all the time to do this stuff? Now, admittedly, Robert Smith's not quite like Prince in so much as he could record a new song in between breakfast and lunch. Uh, but uh, certainly very, very prolific at this point. And the, uh, the sleeve design on that is just gorgeous. If you stared at it, you could probably see the face of God ascending from heaven. Um, by the way, the B-side of Like an Animal is called Mouth to Mouth. And it is one of the best B-sides I have ever heard by anybody, ever. And I will arm wrestle Arnold Schwarzenegger rather than change that. But please, Arnie, don't make me prove that. I'd rather not. Um, 2006 saw the deluxe edition double CD reissue of Blue Sunshine. Uh, and here we've got the whole album on 10 tracks. You've got an extra five songs 
Um, so you've got the B-sides and you've got some remixes. And then on the second disc, you've got uh, 10 vocal demos by Robert Smith. And you've got a number of alternate mixes, uh, which haven't been previously intro issued. And a couple of extra songs which haven't been issued either, including And All Around Us The Mermaids Sang and Holiday 80. Uh, well worth picking up, by the way, if you get a chance. If you're interested in The Cure, you've only, you've got an incomplete picture of the band, unless you hear this. Uh, although, of course, it is not a Cure album. Um, it just happens to have The Cure's vocalist and guitarist and main songwriter on it. I love The Glove. Um, and as I've said, I'm going to use this as an opportunity to talk about every single band I've ever liked. Um, so, next single was The Cure's Love Cats, which I think was released in December 1983, when I was 10 years old. Uh, the seven inch. Uh, this copy belonged to Debbie Moulton. Uh, people used to write their names in the sleeves of seven inch singles and 12 inch singles. So when you took them to parties, they wouldn't get stolen because it's got my bloody name on it. It's my record, not yours. And there was also a 12 inch of Love Cats. Uh, and the 12 inch of Love Cats has an extended mix of Love Cats on it. It's also backed with two extra tracks, Speak My Language and Mr Pink Eyes. And uh, Mr Pink Eyes was only available on this 12 inch for a very long time until the release of the 2004's Join the Dots box set compilation. But everything else was released in its original seven inch form on this album, Japanese Whispers, which came out in December, I think 1983, as a kind of a Christmas uh, mini album from The Cure. Um, and this is an original version of it. It's got the, uh, it's got a lyric sleeve, or more correctly, a, kind of like an inner sleeve, but it isn't really an inner sleeve. And it came in a paper bag. And this paper bag uh, has 983 on it right there in the bottom. So that means it's an original inner sleeve. I don't even know why I'm telling you that, really. Um, there was one guy who I knew, who I haven't met for 30 years, who told me that German records smelt better than the English ones, and that's why he bought the German versions. Uh, rest assured, I pretended to sniff the record just to shut him up and make him go away. So, Japanese Whispers came out in December 1983. Eight-track EP, big selling album. Lots of people bought it, uh, and quite rightly so. And then, at the end of 1983, also saw the release of the first Susie and the Banshees album with Robert Smith on it. This is Nocturne, recorded live at the London Royal Albert Hall on, I think, the 30th and 31st of October, 1983. Uh, I didn't buy this when this came out. I bought this about five years ago for one pound from a charity shop that had all the Susie and the Banshees albums on vinyl. Um, I thought, well, it's about time I own them. And so I did. Uh, I did have cassette copies of them all. I was very limited by my budget at the time. Uh, and it's a just a, a great live double album um, that's and you can really tell by the way that Robert Smith is playing guitar on these songs even though uh, you might think well it's just a guitarist playing songs so he hasn't written any any um, originals uh, that are with the Banshees that are on this record I think um, and it's well worth getting one of the best live albums of all time and I'll, I'll pick up on a Susie and the Banshees thing in a moment, actually. Um, so, Susie and the Banshees were touring, and at the same time, Robert Smith went into the studio uh, to record the fruits for what would be the next Cure studio album. And the first fruits of that were released on this seven inch single, The Caterpillar. Andy Anderson was, was played on the album alongside Robert and Lol. Phil Fornelli, I don't think, played on any of the songs on the album but frankly if you've got Robert Smith why pay somebody else to do it if you can just play bass anyway and uh, the Caterpillar is is one of the loveliest silliest songs that The Cure just didn't play live anywhere near enough until about 2011 when they brought it back into the set and I think they played it for the first time in something like 20 years when they headlined Be uh, Festival in, in the Isle of Wight in 2011 when nobody knew what the lineup was going to be let alone what the set list was going to be. And they played Caterpillar in the encore, uh, which was one heck of a surprise. Uh, and then that, that show was released as a live album. But I'm jumping ahead in time and history. Uh, I love the Caterpillar. 
the video by the way was shot at Kew Gardens and when you listen to the caterpillar there's a sound that sounds like a butterfly flapping its wings that's Andy Anderson playing drums on his leather trousers uh, according to what I'm told uh, and Andy may he rest in peace uh, was a great drummer for the band um, very different from Lowell very different from Boris and Jason but a great drummer and he really added something to the sound and uh, Andy also plays on the Glove album uh, so it's you know, practically a, a Cure record in that respect. Caterpillar came out on a 12-inch. also came out on a picture disc 7-inch, but I decided to buy, I think, the Ghostbusters uh, single on picture disc instead of Caterpillar. Uh, which one of those has held its resale value? Well, I'll tell you now, it's, it's not Ghostbusters. There's also a 12-inch of the Caterpillar that comes with an extra track. So the B-sides on, on uh, Caterpillar are Happy the Man, and throw your foot away and throw your foot away is uh, just a lovely silly song happy the man uh, was played live in 1984 the cover art like all the cure cover art at this point is done by parched art which is, uh, is i think andy vella and paul thompson and paul thompson being the band's first guitar player who left before the recording of three imaginary boys um, came back into the fold around about this time i think they needed someone to pay to play saxophone on the track give me it which is on the on this album uh, the next cure studio album the top and uh, paul played saxophone and then he was asked if he wanted to join the bands and he became an integral part of the band for probably the near enough the next decade playing guitar keyboards saxophone and also designing the cure artwork so, you know, if you want to think about someone who's only made a major contribution to the band, Paul is it. Paul is in there. Um, and the next studio album, The Top, was released on the 28th of May, 1984, which is really bizarre because I can't think of this album being 37 years old. Well, it isn't. It's only 36, but now it'll be 37 in a month's time. And as I've mentioned before, if there's one thing which comes out from the glove, it also comes out from the top, and that is that drugs are fantastic. The top is not my favourite Cure album, in fact it's near the bottom, but that's not to say it's not good, because the Cure have made very, very, very good albums all the way through, and even albums which are not my favourites are still very good indeed, and the top is a very good album. Um, I love it, it's so strange and weird, and gripping in psychedelia, and just weird, unusual, strange approaches to to melody, to lyrics. It's got yeah, the it's, the songs go to places you wouldn't necessarily expect them to go. It starts off with the paranoid drug crawl of Shake Dog Shake, which the band play live very very frequently. Uh, Shake Dog Shake is not my favourite Cure song, song, not by a long long shot. I think it's very repetitive and it's very one dimensional. It's a great dimension, but I like a song with a little bit more dynamics in it. Um, but I love it when they play it live. And it's then followed by Bird Mad Girl, which is, you couldn't write a song like Bird Mad Girl unless you'd had, you know, cocaine for breakfast, or LSD probably more likely. Um, and then there's Wailing Wall, Give Me It, which is this really dark, intense, angry, furious thing, uh, and Dressing Up, which is just this lovely bit of, of charming, silly, airy, fluffy whimsy. Side two is the caterpillar, piggy in the mirror, the empty world, banana fish bones, which reminds me for some reason of Tom Waits and the top. And some of these songs are 100% doom and gloom music to slit your wrists to. The top, the empty world, uh, the wailing wall, for example. Uh, but then other ones are bright, breezy, psychedelic pop, the caterpillar, bird mad girl dressing up. Uh, um, just bizarre, lovely, silly songs. And Banana Fish Bones has the most unusual ha use of harmonica I think I've ever heard. Um, it's a great album. And I don't think it aged particularly well. It's an album very much of its time. Its time is probably about 3.36am, fucked off your box, watching uh, the Beatles movies in a cramped flat in London. And two weeks after that, lo and behold, came another album uh, which Robert had recorded, this time as guitarist, Hyena by Susie and the Banshees. So the guy wasn't letting the grass grow beneath his feet. Um, 
Again, this is, is very much almost a companion piece to the top. Listening to one without knowing the other, it feels a little bit incomplete. There's a couple of songs on here that, that uh, could easily, easily have been on Blue Sunshine or The Top had someone else sang them. So, for example, Dazzle uh, and Painting Bone uh, are really obvious choices uh, to that. Um, but it's a, it's a solid, good album and uh, a very unusual one. Um, now, two days or not, not many days before the start of Susie and the Banshees tour to promote this album, Robert Smith decided that things like sleep were quite important and he couldn't be both a member of Susie and the Banshees and The Cure, so he left Susie and the Banshees, which led Susie Sue to perhaps somewhat callously say that Fat Bob has nothing to do with this album apart from that he plays on it, which is pretty harsh, I think. Um, but I think things have mellowed a little bit since then. Uh, but being in two bands that were both on, on tour at the, at the same time in different parts of the world uh, and trying to commit to both of them, it's just impossible. You can't do it. I've tried that. The cloning project has not been successful. And around about the same time as well came the release of, of this single um, by Tim Pope called I Want To Be A Tree, which I think uh, is um, has the cure as Tim Pope's backing band and recorded during the same sessions as the top. And if I'm wrong, I'm very sorry. I haven't thought about this in a huge amount of detail. Um, but uh, it's I Want To Be t A Tree on the A side, um, which sounds very much like it could have been taken from, from the top. It's got that same kind of air of, of whimsy, unusual psychedelia around it and it's backed with a song called i think it doesn't even tell me what it's called i remember what it's what it was called you know it's got some unusual very very long title indeed um the double crossing of two-faced fred uh according to the label on here and it's just a lovely strange silly single um i would listen to it on youtube if i were you and there's a link i'm going to post down there it gives you a, uh, a link to listen to this. Now, with all that in mind, The Cure then went on tour. And um, before The Cure go on tour, I have to very quickly point out that if you want to get Susie and the Banshees albums on CD, by the way, in uh, 20, uh, 2015, maybe 2016, they released two box sets, these ones here and here, uh, which contain... The original studio albums, no bonus tracks, in vinyl replica sleeves and replicating the original uh, track listings of the original vinyl releases of the album. These were about £10-£12 when they came out. Knowing my luck, they're far more expensive than that now, and I'll be trying to talk you into spending a huge amount of money on discogs for box sets you don't need. Um, but these are you know, really uh, useful and faithful kind of reproductions of the band's albums. Uh, there. If you want a quick entry point into the world of Susie and the Banshees and you can afford them and you can find them cheap enough, buy these. If of course you're the person that has to own every last single thing by Susie and the Banshees, then uh, be prepared to say goodbye to a lot of money. I'd also like to point out there's a Susie and the Banshees at the BBC box set. This contains I think four live tracks that Robert plays on and two mimings to Dear Prudence on top of the pops so you don't have to go broke if you need to find it uh, it's not worth the money frankly the cure went on tour and at this point their their lineup was uh, robert long and the phil fawn alley was back on bass for most of the tour and paul thompson had joined on guitars keyboards uh saxophones and other weird noises Phil Fawn Alley wasn't available for the first eight or nine shows, so the bass player for the first eight or nine shows uh, was a musician called Norman Foster Jones, also known as Noco, uh, also who has played in pretty much every band in the world ever since. I've seen him in both Apollo 440 and Magazine, uh, playing bass in Apollo 440 and guitar in Magazine, which I didn't even know at the time I was doing it, because um, it was one of those bands where the lineups change so often you can't keep track of who's doing what anymore. Uh, and Norman was in the band for, I think, eight or nine shows, including the first show of the top tour, which was televised from Munich in, I think, the 1st of March, I think, 1984, maybe the 1st of May. I'm not quite sure. Uh, and then Phil joined after a few shows after he'd finished his other recording commitments as a producer. So the Cure go on tour. And this is where things get more complicated. Uh, the Cure release 
uh, two VHS tapes. The first one is The Tea Party, which is a compilation of their promotional videos, uh, which was released in 1985. The second one is called The Cure Live in Japan, and it's one of the only Cure official releases I haven't got, and hardly anybody has got it, because it was a Betamax and VHS and V2000 format live concert recorded in Japan on the last night of the top tour in Japan and only sold there. Uh, it may have been sold on by import in Australia, um, but it was it's very, very difficult to find. I think there was a copy of it that was on Discogs for something like £400, £500. It's never been issued on DVD. It is, of course, available on YouTube in pretty low quality, um, but it is it is an essential part of the Cure history. It's the first officially released nearly full live Cure document. Um, but instead of that, in the UK, uh, we got, and the rest of the world, we got the first official Cure live album, Concert, The Cure Live. Now, as I've said before in a previous episode about the worst live albums of all time, this is not the best Cure live record. Effectively, it's almost a, a live bootleg. Um, and there were a lot of Cure live bootlegs, by the way, an awful lot. Can't pretend that there weren't. This was recorded on the UK version of the top tour over shows at Oxford, uh, London, and yeah, three shows at the London Hammersmith Odeon, uh, now called the Apollo, and at the Oxford Apollo as well. So over four shows, uh, it's ten songs, it's uh, pretty much a kind of greatest hits live. It's quite slop sloppily edited, so for example I think the first note of Primary cuts in a little late, the transitions between the tracks and the recording venues are different, so you can tell for example between Charlotte Sometimes and The Hanging Garden, uh, when the recording at Charlotte Sometimes in Oxford ends on the 5th of May, it's quite an abrupt transition through to The Hanging Garden, so it sounds like a compilation tape of live stuff. It's the cure, raw, live, unfiltered, no overdubs. In fact, it could really benefit from overdubs, um, just as it is, playing 10 songs live. Uh, and it's it's a you know a very honest warts and all live representation of the cure, effectively to try and stop the bootleggers. Um, of course, it didn't work. There are gazillions of cure bootlegs and unre un unofficial live albums out there. Um, but as we get further into the Cure's career, you'll be seeing more of those. Uh, the cassette version of Concert, which I mentioned previously, comes with Curiosity, which is a number of live tracks um, which aren't available, uh, well, weren't available anywhere else for a very long period of time indeed. So the extra songs that were on Curiosity uh, include a version of Forever recorded in Paris, uh, lots of songs from, um, so for example... Uh, demos from the uh, and live recordings from the Rocket and Crawley, the first studio demos, uh, French radio concerts, Holland, all over the place, all over various periods of time, uh, lots of them. And uh, it, thankfully, the live material has all now been issued on the various two CD editions of the albums, uh, so you don't need to buy the cassette. But I bought it before the box sets came out. And that's how I roll, baby. Um, and the 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 final thing, um, aside from concert, was Excerpt, the Cure Live, which was uh, not released in the UK, I think, as a single. I think this is the German 12-inch of it, which is a Forest and Primary. Uh, and it's uh, it's pretty good. Um, but, that was in, but it's not an essential purchase, because everything is on concert. And the top was also re-released in 2006 as a two-CD version here, uh, with um, the album on one disc and 17 mostly unreleased tracks on CD2, including a track called Aerial, which the band performed live on a Peel session, uh, and demos of A Hand Inside My Mouth, most of the top album, alternate studio mixes of Dressing Up and Wailing Wall, four extra live songs, including the ones that are on the, the Curiosity cassette. And in 2001, the band uh, had a mini microsite uh, where you could download low-quality MP3s of alternate versions of songs that were on their Greatest Hits album. Uh, the site is obviously long dead and gone now. Uh, but I downloaded the songs, and I think that includes a live version of The Caterpillar that hasn't been available anywhere else. And maybe, maybe a couple of other live songs. But in total, uh, you can piece together 16 officially released audio tracks from the tour, including the four that are on this and the ten 
which are on the um, the concert album, plus the Caterpillar, if you can find it. And again, if I can find it on YouTube, I'm going to put the link down there alongside a link to the Live in Japan video. But that's not all. The Cure were far from finished. And as um, detailed in, in this, uh, Andy Anderson left the, the tour before the tour had finished for two reasons. The, uh, the main reason was that he was drinking a lot and he got himself arrested a couple of times, one time of which where he was maced by a racist security guard at a hotel in Japan who refused to believe that a black man could afford to stay in a hotel as, as expensive as The Cure were staying in. Um, but it became obvious that The Cure could not continue with Andy as the band's drummer. I think Andy's a great drummer. I think he gave the gave the Cure a very solid, very rock sound. Actually, He's a very boxy drummer, very nailed on to rhythm parts. Maybe not perhaps as graceful as Boris. Uh, maybe not as as rigid as Lol. Uh, but a good drummer, and he did a lot of good work in the band. And uh, he's since he died recently of cancer. God bless him. Um, I rated him highly as one of the better drummers that had sat in that hello point. Um, and the band had, I think, 16 dates left when Andy left. Um, so they uh, they got Vince Eli, who was a friend of Phil Fornalli. Vince Eli was a drummer in the Psychedelic Furs who wasn't doing anything, who played a number of shows. But Vince had to carry on and pick up his Psychedelic Furs work. Uh, and then a friend of the band, um, Boris Bransby-Williams, who was holidaying in L.A., on uh, his honeymoon with his new wife in 1984, was rung up and said, do you want to play some shows with The Cure? Um, Boris was like, yeah, OK. So Lowell also had a drum kit brought out. So for uh, the last 16 shows of the tour, uh, half with Vince, half with Boris, Lowell was also playing extra drums and percussion. So The Cure had two drummers. Um, other bands that have had two drummers include... I think, and you will know us by the Trail of the Dead. And uh, so, therefore, you know, The Cure had two drummers for a short period of time towards the tail end of the top tour. Uh, and Boris joined the group and he played the last few shows. Uh, and there was a time when I think they were having a, a photo of the band and, you know, the, the four of them lined up and Boris kind of sat down and Robert said, what are you doing sitting down? Well, I want you to be in the picture because you're in The Cure. And that's pretty much how Boris joined The Cure. And Boris then became the band's third drummer who stayed with the band for the next four, five albums and the next decade or so uh, from late 1984 to late 1994. And I'll talk about that later on. Finally, uh, when the tour came to an end, Phil Fornalli went back to his production work and the, uh, the band needed a bass player. And after some um, circuitous conversations around the subject, Simon Gallup came back into the group uh, and started playing on demos for the songs that would follow the album that came out after the top. All that is yet to come. Um, so today I have, have talked at great length about a very, very, very busy period of The Cure's career. Uh, and there are three studio albums, four in fact, which have come out during that period. So we've got... Um, the Glove, we've got Nocturne, the top, you can tell this is well rehearsed, Hyena, Concert, and Japanese Whispers, which is over there. Um, the Glove are very underrated, I recommend them highly, please give them a listen. Uh, Robert's work with Susie and the Banshees is really great. And The Cure were, were obviously, you know, heading and getting better with every release and with every tour at this point so and this is where i come in because this is about the time where i stopped learning about the cure's history and i started watching it whilst it was happening um, because i became aware of the cure very close to the period around about the time of the head on the door which is going to be the next time i talk about the cure whenever that's going to be um in the meantime i'm going to post down there links to the munich show the live in japan video uh, Nocturne, if it's on, on YouTube. Uh, I Want to Be a Tree, if it's on there as well. And I will hopefully see you all again. Some of you I may even see in person. Again, I have no idea when that's going to be. 
I cannot wait to be in the same room with some of you listening to bands that write sad songs that make us feel good and crying and drinking and just generally doing all the things that we've sorely, sorely missed. Hopefully, it's not that long now. It feels like we're coming towards the end and we're leaning into something else. But that's all for the future. I'm going to stop now. I'm going to go downstairs. I'm going to go and watch Taskmaster. And I'm going to go and eat chocolate. Um, now, you may think that's all I ever do is sit down on the sofa, eat chocolate, and then occasionally talk at my mobile phone about music that I love. Rest assured, there are things I love that aren't music, and I will talk about them. But I'm going through the music now. Uh, I also have some, some other things which I'm going to be talking about in future episodes. All the bands you've seen before whose discographies I have not finished, I am going to get around to all of those. But if there's a band which you think or know that I like that you'd be interested to hear me talk about, uh, do put a comment below. And uh, if I think I can, I can make it work, I'll give it a shot. In the meantime, stay safe and we will all be together again sometime soon. Sooner than you think. Longer than we want, but sooner than we fear. I'll see you all again and goodbye.